In 1858, Minnesota was admitted to the Union. Its constitution declared that there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the state. Thus, Minnesota joined the ranks of 16 other free states in a nation that also included 15 states where the slavery of African Americans was legal. Only three years later, Minnesotans would be among the first to answer the call to fight in a bloody civil war, a war that would settle the matter of slavery, yet leave much work undone. Work that continues today as America still seeks to fulfill the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness guaranteed to all. In this look back at Minnesota's 150 years of statehood, we'll recall some of the milestones that have marked the struggle for human rights in our state. It's an epic story, a blockbuster, with twists and turns and fascinating characters, and it's still being written. It's a story to which we can all still contribute, but to do so, we need to know what's happened so far. Let's begin at the beginning of Minnesota's entry into the Union. Minnesota became part of the United States as the Minnesota Territory in 1849, and eight years later, Minnesotans drafted a constitution. Well, actually, two constitutions, one written by Republicans and one by Democrats. A major point of contention, whether black males should have the right to vote. Republicans argued yes, but Democrats strongly disagreed, and the only way to break this deadlock and allow Minnesota to become a state was a compromise. So Republicans and Democrats agreed that the Constitution would prohibit slavery and guarantee religious freedom. But while everyone could worship as they chose, only white males would be allowed to vote. But as part of the compromise, the Constitution would be easy to change, allowing Republicans to come back and amend it in the future. That they did, coming back time and time again to raise the issue of non-white suffrage. In 1868, ten years after Minnesota became a state and three years after the end of the Civil War, they finally succeeded in passing an amendment to Minnesota's Constitution. Minnesota thus became one of the few states to voluntarily extend voting rights to blacks, two years before the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution would mandate non-white suffrage. The Battle of Gettysburg, fought over three days in July 1863, is said to have marked the turning point of the Civil War. Between 46,000 and 51,000 Americans died in that battle that ended with Confederate General Lee's retreat to Virginia. Four months later, President Lincoln would honor their sacrifice and invoke the principles of liberty for which the Union had fought in his famous Gettysburg Address. Minnesota played a pivotal role in that battle. The 1st Minnesota Regiment answered the call, and on the second day of the battle, amid savage fighting and mounting Union casualties, a force of 262 Minnesotans charged the Confederate lines, engaging a force four times its size. In the end, more than 80% of the 1st Minnesota Regiment was dead or injured, but their heroism had halted a Southern advance and bought other Union troops precious time a sacrifice that would ultimately lead to victory. While the Civil War was raging, another armed conflict between the United States and the Dakota people would claim hundreds of lives. The Dakota conflict began on August 17, 1862, along the Minnesota River in southwest Minnesota, but its roots stretch back to Minnesota's earliest days as a territory. An 1851 treaty between the U.S. and Dakota leaders had ceded vast amounts of Indian land to the Union in exchange for money and goods, but much of the promised compensation was never received or siphoned off by corrupt traders. In 1862, the Dakota faced food shortages and famine. The attitudes of some white settlers were perhaps summed up by trader Andrew Myrick, who declared that so far as he was concerned, if the Dakota people were hungry, let them eat grass or their own dung. A series of attacks by Dakota warriors erupted in Meeker County. Trader Myrick was among the first killed. He was found with grass stuffed into his mouth. Dakota raids on farms and settlements in south central Minnesota continued, and over the next six weeks, white settlers and Minnesota troops would sustain heavy casualties. In the end, the Dakota would surrender, 
and more than 300 would be sentenced to death by military tribunals. President Lincoln commuted the death sentences of most, but refused to spare 38 others. They were hanged in a mass public execution from a single scaffold on December 26, 1862, in Mankato. It was, and still is, the largest execution in U.S. history. At the dawn of the third year of the Civil War, on January 1, 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. It declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforth shall be free. The proclamation did not immediately free a single slave. It applied only to states that had seceded from the Union, and its promise depended upon the Union winning the war. It also exempted border states that had not joined the Confederacy. But the proclamation helped transform the war, in the eyes of many in the North, into a war to abolish the scourge of slavery, adding moral force to the Union's growing military strength. The war ended with the surrender of the Confederate Army on April 18, 1865. In January of that year, Congress passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. It abolished slavery in the United States. A year later, the 14th Amendment would grant citizenship to former slaves and to all persons born or naturalized in the United States. The 14th Amendment also declared that no state could deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws which applied to federal and state governments. Despite these amendments, the promise of equal protection under the law and the right to vote would remain unfulfilled for at least 100 years. Poll taxes, literacy tests, and intimidation would remain barriers to true equality and reminders of the legacy of slavery. Yet these measures would become the basis for changes that would redefine civil rights and reshape America in the 20th century. In the aftermath of the Civil War and continuing into the 20th century, more than 400 state laws, constitutional amendments, and city ordinances legalizing segregation and discrimination were passed in the United States. These laws govern nearly every aspect of daily life, from education to public transportation to health care and housing and the use of public facilities. While the majority of Jim Crow laws discriminated specifically against African Americans, other minority groups, including Asians and Native Americans, also were frequently targeted. In Minnesota, one of the nation's most progressive states, eight anti-segregation laws were passed between 1877 and 1947, reversing Jim Crow laws and giving minorities full access to public schools, transportation, and other public facilities. In 1866, Congress passed a Civil Rights Act that declared that all persons born in the United States were now citizens without regard to race, color, or previous condition of servitude. As citizens, they could make contracts, testify, and sue in court, and own private property. President Andrew Johnson had vetoed the bill, saying that blacks were not qualified to be citizens and that the bill would operate in favor of the colored and against the white race. On April 9, 1866, Congress overrode the veto. Under the act, those who denied the rights of citizenship to former slaves were guilty of a misdemeanor and, if convicted, could face a fine of up to $1,000 or imprisonment for up to a year or both. In 1867, Minnesota established a state board of immigration to persuade potential settlers to move to our state. And by the end of the decade, 65% of Minnesota residents were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. German immigrants settled in cities like New Alm, Sleepy Eye, Shakopee, Stillwater, and St. Cloud. Norwegians at first settled in Goodhue, Fillmore, and Houston counties, lured by the promise of plenty of land for farming. Swedes also came for the land. Minnesota, with its rivers, lakes, and forests, reminded many of the similar geography of their homeland. This Minnesota is a glorious country, wrote Swedish author Fredrika Bremer. Just the country for northern immigrants. Just the country for a new Scandinavia.
Martha Ripley, born in 1843, was one of the first female physicians in the United States and a lifelong advocate for women's rights. In 1886, she opened a woman-owned and operated hospital in Minneapolis called Maternity Hospital. At a time when hospital deliveries were rare, her facility sought to provide a safe childbirth experience for women, including those who were shunned and abandoned, often because they had become pregnant out of wedlock. Her compassionate approach combined medical treatment with social care and taught new mothers how to care properly for their babies, while also helping them to find work. Ripley also served as president of the Minnesota Suffrage Association and petitioned the state legislature for women's voting rights. She said in 1911 of her hospital, It has been a home and shelter for deserted wives and widows, for homeless infants and wronged and betrayed girls who needed its shelter and skillful care. In all these long years, it has been like a wise and loving mother to all who have come through its doors. Frederick McGee was Minnesota's first black attorney, taking the oath on June 17, 1889, shortly after arriving in St. Paul, and arguing his first case less than a month later. For McGee, there would be many firsts in life, law, and politics. He became involved almost immediately in challenging Jim Crow laws in the courts, and with W.E.B. Du Bois and other black leaders, in 1904 he formed the Niagara Movement, the forerunner of the NAACP. His views were often at odds with the majority, including the majority of blacks, who were Republicans. McGee was a Democrat and, unlike most blacks, a Catholic. Yet throughout his life, he remained true to his own beliefs and a tireless advocate for the rights of African Americans. Although the Spanish-American War sparked unprecedented levels of patriotism as pro-war fever swept the nation during the late 1890s, not all Americans applauded the cause. African Americans especially were divided on the war. Some argued that an oppressed people should not take up arms on behalf of their oppressors. Others believe that brave fighting by black soldiers would enhance the standing of their race, and many black soldiers were eager to prove themselves. Despite their valor, African Americans who answered the call to duty often found themselves victims of white racism and anti-black violence while serving in the armed forces, and the war did little in the long term to defeat Jim Crow and break down the barriers of prejudice. The first African American elected to the Minnesota Legislature was also the first African American to graduate from the University of Minnesota Law School. John Frank Wheaton was born in Hagerstown, Maryland, where his father claimed to be the first black man to vote in that state. Young Wheaton was educated at Howard University and moved to Minnesota in 1890. After graduating from law school, he began his long career in state politics. In 1896, he was elected a member of the Minnesota delegation to the Republican Convention in St. Louis, and two years later won a seat in the Minnesota House of Representatives. He was a supporter of civil rights and lobbied for the commissioning of black officers during the Spanish-American War. Wheaton died in 1938. Robert Bobby Marshall was an All-American end on the rough-and-tumble gopher football teams of 1904, 05, and 06. The grandson of slaves in Virginia, Marshall grew up in Minneapolis and attended Central High School, where he excelled in sports. At the University of Minnesota, he proved to be an outstanding student as well as a fine athlete, graduating in 1907 with a law degree. But there were too few African-American clients in the Twin Cities to support another black lawyer, and sports offered more opportunities. He played professional baseball for teams in Minneapolis and St. Paul in a segregated black league, only later resuming his legal practice. An all-around athlete, he also played pro football and was briefly a professional motorcycle racer. There are those who argue that in his prime, he was the best athlete to come out of the state of Minnesota, and his name might have been even more legendary had it not been for segregation. He died in 1958 at age 72. On December 8, 1905, Nellie Stone Johnson was born on a farm near Lakeville. Both her parents were active members of the Farmer Labor Party and role models for the young girl, who helped out her father by delivering union leaflets on horseback. In 
As a teenager working as an elevator operator at the Minneapolis Athletic Club, she organized her fellow workers after management cut their wages. She would be active in labor, civil rights, and politics in Minnesota throughout much of her life. And in 1945, she became the first African American elected to public office in Minneapolis when she was elected to the library board. She would serve as an advisor and mentor to many Democratic leaders, including Hubert Humphrey, Walter Mondale, and Paul Wellstone. She died in 2002 at the age of 96, leaving a legacy of political activism that helped shape our understanding of racism and what it means to be an American. The First World War not only united America to defeat a common enemy, it brought Americans from many nationalities together in ways that few might have anticipated when the war began. In the early part of the 20th century, tensions were high between Catholics and Protestants, between Jews, Irish, and Italians. Each new wave of immigrants settled in their own ethnic neighborhood and went to church, socialized with, and married within their own culture. But the First World War changed that. Regiments drew from every race, creed, color, and social group, and men from different religions and nationalities would be together and depended upon each other for their very survival. The role of African Americans in the military also changed. When the U.S. entered the war seeking volunteers, blacks were not allowed to enlist because quotas for African Americans were filled. When the draft came in, blacks were once again accepted and over 400,000 African Americans would serve in this conflict, in segregated units, in a fight for democratic liberties they themselves did not enjoy. Unlike blacks, American Indians in World War I served in integrated units, and no group made a larger per capita contribution. Indian tribes had their own languages and dialects that few outside the tribes understood, and many of their languages were not written down. That made them an ideal resource for the U.S. military, which needed to protect its radio, telephone, and telegraph messages from German intelligence. The military recruited these Indians as code talkers to send messages back and forth in their native languages. The Germans were never able to break this code. Women throughout America had sought the right to vote since at least the mid-1850s, but their efforts had been met with scorn and ridicule. By 1875, Minnesota women could vote in school elections, but their franchise ended there. In Minnesota, one of the leading advocates for women's suffrage was Clara Hampson Euland. In the years after World War I, she argued that mothers have been the force that makes for better homes and higher civilization, and that women voters would bring a new moral concern to politics. In 1920, the passage of the 19th Amendment guaranteed that the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Shortly thereafter, Clara Hampson Ulan became the first president of the National League of Women Voters. In 1920, in an event that would shock the nation, three young black men, wrongly accused of rape, were lynched by a mob in Duluth, Minnesota. Two teenagers, James Sullivan and Irene Tuscan, claimed they had both been assaulted by black workers employed by a traveling circus and that Tuscan had been raped by five or six of them. Although a medical examination later found no evidence of rape or assault, Duluth police arrested six black men identified by the teenagers, and soon a mob of between 5,000 and 10,000 people formed outside the Duluth city jail. The mob seized three black men, Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee, held a mock trial and found them guilty of Irene Tuscan's rape. They were taken to First Street and Second Avenue East, where they were lynched. The next day, the Minnesota National Guard arrived in Duluth to guard the remaining prisoners. The killings made headlines throughout the country. Many were shocked that such an atrocity had happened in Minnesota. In 2003, the city of Duluth erected a memorial to the murdered workers, and thousands of citizens gathered to recall this sad chapter in Minnesota history and to plea for tolerance and humanity. There was more proof that racism and hate were not the province of the southern states. The year after the Duluth lynchings, Minnesota became the first state to pass an anti-lynching law. 
The following year, in 1922, the Ku Klux Klan held its first meeting in Minnesota, in a woods near Minneapolis. By the next year, there were as many as 10 active Ku Klux Klan chapters in Minneapolis alone. Its influence in Minnesota and the Dakotas continued to grow throughout the early 1920s. There were chapters on college campuses throughout the Midwest, and nationally, the Klan's membership was believed to number at least 100,000. The Klan would fade in the North toward the end of the 1920s as opposition to Klan violence grew and other issues came to dominate public attention. But the prejudice and fear that motivated cross burnings and other notorious Klan activities remained toward blacks, Jews, Catholics, and anyone who was not, in the Klan's estimation, a true loyal American. Until 1924, Indians were not universally considered citizens of the United States. Although many had become citizens through military service, special treaties, or by marrying a citizen, some could not vote or enjoy the other rights of citizenship, and there was no path of naturalization available to them, as there was for new immigrants. Then in 1924, Congress passed the Federal Indian Citizenship Act, which granted citizenship to all Native Americans born in the United States. The move was seen as part of some U.S. leaders' goal to assimilate Indians into the American mainstream and to recognize their valiant service to the nation in World War I. In 1927, 10 young African Americans created the Kredjafon Social Club. The club provided the Twin Cities black community with cultural, social, and recreational activities and was also a source of economic development, philanthropy, and activism. The club eventually opened a cooperative food outlet and a credit union, offered college scholarships, and worked to integrate hotels. The name of the club was derived by using a letter from each of the original 10 members' names. Jews have lived in Minnesota since it was created as a territory in 1849. Like many immigrants, they came to the United States to escape religious and political persecution, yet often found it here in America, and especially in Minnesota. While many American cities discriminated against Jews by limiting where they could live, work, or attend school, Minneapolis in particular had a nationwide reputation for its anti-Semitism. From the 1880s through the 1950s, the city's Jews were excluded from membership in many organizations, faced employment discrimination, and were not allowed to buy homes in certain neighborhoods. The Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota originated in Minneapolis in the 1930s in response to events abroad and at home. The persecution of Jews in Nazi Germany, the activities of hate groups like the Silver Shirts in Minnesota, and the anti-Semitic overtones of the 1938 Minnesota gubernatorial campaign all encouraged the formation of an organization to monitor and protest these activities. Beginning in 1936, an informal organization, the Anti-Defamation Council of Minnesota, was the vehicle of Jewish protest against all forms of anti-Semitism. In later years, the council worked for passage of fair employment practices laws and became involved in a wide range of community activities, supporting civil rights, civil liberties, separation of church and state, and cooperation among religious faiths. Pipestone National Monument was created by an act of Congress in 1937. For centuries, Indians had come to this site to quarry the red stone called Pipestone, used to carve sacred ornamental pipes, treasured possessions that were often buried with ancestors. In the 19th century, the carved pipes found their way into white society through trade, and though an 1858 treaty had promised Indians free access to the area, white settlers came to dig pits and extract the sacred stone. When Pipestone National Monument was signed into existence, the land was open to the public, but quarrying was limited to Indians. Pipestone National Monument is located in southwestern Minnesota, just north of the city of Pipestone. In 1941, America entered World War II with an armed force of only 175,000, that force would grow to more than 8 million by the war's end. 
But the war against Hitler's Third Reich and the Japanese Imperial Army was fought not only by American soldiers, Marines, sailors, and pilots. It was a war that was fought and ultimately won by the American people, by farmers and factory workers, by civilians of both genders and all races, men, women, African Americans, Indians, Asian Americans, and Hispanics. By the end of the war, 150,000 American women were serving in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps as clerks, typists, researchers, engineers, mechanics, and electricians. Another 74,000 women served in the American Army and Navy Nurse Corps, and women also served in other military branches. They were not allowed positions in combat, but many worked in harm's way, and some were killed. At home, women were filling jobs left by those who were serving in the military, jobs usually reserved for men. Women also found new opportunities in other fields, including on the ball field. The All-American Girls Baseball League was created, reflecting the shortage of Major League male baseball players. African Americans were allowed to enlist in the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard under the 1940 Selective Service Act, and President Roosevelt also gave them permission to join the Air Corps. They served in segregated battalions. Military officials supported segregation because they believed integration would cause social disruption. After the war, President Truman issued a policy of equality of treatment and opportunity in the military. And despite the opposition of some military commanders, by the end of the Korean conflict, more than 90% of African Americans served in integrated units. In many large metropolitan areas, blacks and Hispanics continued to be targets of racial animosity throughout the 30s and 40s. In 1943, race riots erupted in Detroit, Los Angeles, and Harlem, fueled by long-standing injustices. Concerned that such riots might happen in Minnesota, Governor Edward Tye created a commission to study discrimination and economic inequality and suggest solutions. The commission was later renamed the Governor's Human Rights Commission. Part of its mission was to educate the public on discrimination and human rights. It was another beginning and a series of state anti-discrimination laws followed. In 1955, Governor Orville Freeman signed the Fair Employment Practices Act, outlawing discrimination in employment based on race, color, creed, and national origin. These protections would not exist on the federal level until almost a decade later. In 1961, another Minnesota governor, Elmer C. Anderson, signed the State Act Against Discrimination, which added religion to the classes protected in the previous laws. The law would later be expanded to include public accommodations and housing, and would ultimately be absorbed into a 1967 law that would go even further in protecting the rights of all Minnesotans, the Minnesota Human Rights Act. There had been progress, but in the 1940s and early 1950s, basic human rights were still denied to many Minnesotans, including blacks and Jews. In 1946, a famous sociologist, Kerry McWilliams, named Minneapolis as the most anti-Semitic city in the United States. A young Minneapolis mayor, Hubert H. Humphrey, was stung by the designation and set out to change the social climate. That same year, he established the city's Civil Rights Commission, then known as the Mayor's Commission on Human Rights. And in 1948, under Humphrey's leadership, Minneapolis enacted the nation's first municipal fair employment law. The most anti-Semitic city in the United States would eventually, in 1961, elect a Jewish mayor, Arthur Naftalin. Hubert Humphrey had awakened the moral conscience of a city, and in 1948, at the Democratic National Convention, he would speak to the conscience of a nation. In a fiery address, this little-known Minneapolis mayor argued that America had waited too long for justice. He urged the Democratic Party to get out of the shadow of states' rights and walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. His impassioned plea for civil rights led to a walkout by Southern delegates, who later selected Strom Thurmond as the presidential nominee of their state's rights party. But Humphrey nonetheless succeeded in spurring the convention to add a civil rights plank to the Democratic platform.
In the 1700s and 1800s, the policy of the United States government had been to relocate Indians to lands reserved for them, reservations. But in 1953, under President Dwight Eisenhower, the government initiated a policy of encouraging Indians to blend in to the mainstream of American society. Instead of emphasizing the economic development of reservations, the Bureau of Indian Affairs now urged Indians to move to urban areas like the Twin Cities. About 30 percent of American Indians were relocated to cities between 1953 and 1961. While some prospered, many experienced economic and spiritual hardships, unemployment, discrimination, and the loss of traditional cultural support. The federal government would eventually repudiate the policy and re-embrace tribal autonomy over assimilation. But many say the damage was done, that the relocation policy had devastating effects on tribal culture and led to economic and social woes that persist today. Others believe that, despite the hardships, some good came from the mass migration of Indians to the cities, where a revival of spirit and sense of brotherhood would sustain them in a new, often hostile, urban setting. From the 1930s until the 1960s, Rondo Avenue was at the heart of St. Paul's largest black neighborhood. African Americans whose families had lived in Minnesota for decades and others who were just arriving from the South made up a tight-knit community that was in many ways independent of the white society around it. Then came urban renewal. America was on the move and needed more freeways, and almost always African Americans were the ones who would have to make way for what was called progress. Poor and black neighborhoods where property values were lower were targeted for destruction in cities across the country. St. Paul was no exception, and the construction of I-94 effectively erased Rondo and displaced its thousands of African-American families. When the bulldozers came, they had no choice but to move, to neighborhoods that often did not welcome them in a discriminatory housing market. Rondo was gone, but its spirit and legacy is still celebrated every year at St. Paul's annual Rondo Days Festival. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement began to challenge the racism that relegated blacks to the back of the bus and to the status of second-class citizens. One day in February 1960, four black students sat down at a whites-only lunch counter at Woolworths in North Carolina and asked to be served. Although refused service, they stayed at the counter. The event sparked a wave of sit-ins at Woolworths lunch counters across the segregated South, and picket lines sprang up outside Woolworths and Kresge stores throughout the country. In St. Paul, picketers joined the NAACP, boycotting the local Woolworths store until the chain agreed to desegregate all of its lunch counters. In the 1920s, Minnesota saw the arrival of significant numbers of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans from Texas, who came as migrant laborers to work in the fields in the Red River Valley and in processing plants. They would arrive at harvest time and return to Texas or Mexico in the off-season. But as time passed, many began to stay here. Some sought jobs in packing houses in South St. Paul. And by 1940, about 4,000 Mexicans and Mexican-Americans had settled on St. Paul's Lower West Side, on Robert, Wabashaw, and Concord Streets. There, they formed a cohesive working-class community. Its social life centered around the Our Lady of Guadalupe Catholic Church. Then, in the early 1960s, came urban renewal. Housing in the Lower West Side was demolished to make way for industrial development and Mexicans and other Latinos settled in other parts of the neighborhood. Some left the West Side to seek housing elsewhere in St. Paul and Minneapolis, and some, the most affluent, moved to the suburbs. Today, while large numbers of Latinos can be found throughout the Twin Cities, St. Paul's West Side is still home to a strong Latino community. In addition, the neighborhood now includes Lebanese, Syrians, and Southeast Asians who call the West Side home. The Minnesota Indian Affairs Council was created by the legislature in 1963 
its mission to protect the sovereignty of the 11 Minnesota tribes and ensure the well-being of all American Indian citizens throughout the state of Minnesota. The council advises the legislature on the nature of tribal governments and on other Indian affairs issues and administers the Indian Business Loan Program, which offers Indians the opportunity to establish or expand a business in Minnesota. The Council strives for social, economic, and political justice for all American Indians living in the state, while embracing traditional Indian cultural and spiritual values. It is the oldest council in the nation and serves as the official liaison of the Indian tribes and the state of Minnesota. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson on July 2nd of that year. It declared that it was illegal to discriminate in employment on the grounds of race, color, religion, or national origin, and authorized the federal government to act against those who would perpetuate these long-standing inequalities. In addressing the nation on television that evening, President Johnson declared, We believe that all men are created equal, yet many are denied equal treatment. We can understand, without rancor or hatred, how this all happened, but it cannot continue. Our Constitution, the foundation of our Republic, forbids it. Morality forbids it. And the law I will sign tonight forbids it. Passage of the law did not come easily. Although a solid majority in both houses of Congress supported the legislation, Southerners who opposed it staged a filibuster that would last for 57 days. President Johnson and a coalition of labor, religious, and civil rights groups lobbied intensely, and finally, in an effort spearheaded by Senator Hubert Humphrey, a historic closure vote ended the filibuster and the Civil Rights Act became law. On April 27, 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. addressed a crowd of about 4,000 students at the University of Minnesota, speaking out about racism, poverty, and the Vietnam War. The Civil Rights Act had been passed three years earlier, but Dr. King knew that the act was only the first installment to redeem what he called a promissory note on which America had defaulted. To fulfill the promise of equality contained in its Declaration of Independence, much remained to be done, especially in the North. He continued to oppose the war, which had claimed the lives of so many young African Americans, and to denounce long-standing inequalities in northern cities. I see no more dangerous development than the buildup of central cities surrounded by white suburbs, King noted that day at the University of Minnesota. It was the last time many in the crowd would ever hear the legendary civil rights leader in person. He would be assassinated less than one year later. In the late 1960s, young Chicano activists organized to struggle against racism aimed at Latinos and to fight for social justice. Their movement supported and took inspiration from Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, opposed the Vietnam War, and sought to assert Chicano identity in the cities and on college campuses. One of the largest organizations in the struggle was the Brown Berets. A chapter was established in the Twin Cities in 1967. The Brown Berets worked to provide financial, legal, and educational support for the local Chicano population. The organization successfully campaigned for a Chicano Studies program at the University of Minnesota, the first of its kind in the Midwest. In the summer of 1968, three American Indian activists, George Mitchell, Dennis Banks, and Clyde Bellacourt, gathered together a group of 200 Indian community members to talk about their frustration with discrimination and decades of government policies, policies that kept them from controlling their own destinies. Through these efforts to resist racism and reclaim their heritage, the American Indian movement, AIM, was born. AIM soon became a national organization. Its leaders spoke out against high unemployment, slum housing, and discrimination, and also fought for treaty rights and the reclamation of tribal land. The organization attracted international attention during a 71-day armed standoff between AIM followers and U.S. law enforcement officers at Wounded Knee, South Dakota, the site of a U.S. military massacre of 146 Indians in 1890. 
While blacks, women, and other groups were marching and demanding an end to discrimination, gays had remained invisible to most Minnesotans throughout most of the activist 60s, and gays who lost their jobs or faced harassment because of their sexual orientation often had no recourse. Then in 1969, two student activists at the University of Minnesota decided to teach an informal class, The Homosexual and Society. The class laid the foundation for Minnesota's first public gay organization called Free, Fight Repression of Erotic Expression. In the years that followed, Minnesota's GLBT, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community became visible and vocal. Our message was simple, recalled Dolly Rurek, speaking at a rally at the state capitol to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the gay rights movement. We are here, we have always been here, and we always will be here. We ask no special privilege, but only to be treated under the law as others are treated. In 1993, the Minnesota Human Rights Act was amended to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation. Currently, only 17 states and the District of Columbia recognize sexual orientation as a protected class. For three days in January 1969, a group of black students, later joined by other activists, took over Morrill Hall at the University of Minnesota to protest the lack of curriculum and academic opportunities for African American students. Among their demands, that a program be established that would reflect the contributions of black people to the culture of America, that the university contribute to the cost of a conference on black students to be held at the U, and that efforts to recruit black students be accelerated by placing the Martin Luther King Scholarship Program in the hands of the black community. At the time, there were only about 100 black students on the University of Minnesota's Minneapolis campus, but the protest ignited a conversation that focused on their concerns and sparked a series of events that led to historic changes, including the university's first Afro-American African Studies program. Beginning in 1975, Minnesota saw the arrival of a new ethnic group, most of whom came from North Laos. The first Hmong families came as refugees, fleeing in peril from the aftermath of the Vietnam War. They had been recruited by the U.S. government to fight its secret war against communists in Laos. With the fall of Saigon and the North Vietnamese victory, their lives were in jeopardy. Churches aided the humanitarian effort to resettle these refugees, and eventually more than 60,000 Hmong would settle in Minnesota in Duluth, Rochester, Taylor's Falls, and Marshall, but at least half would settle in St. Paul. Minnesota's capital city is now home to the largest urban population of Hmong in the world. In 1977, Rosalie Wall became the first woman to serve on the state Supreme Court. Born in 1924, she was almost 40 when she became, in her own words, tired of sitting outside doors waiting for the men inside to make decisions, and decided to enter William Mitchell's School of Law. She worked as an assistant public defender after graduation, and in 1973, she was offered a professorship at William Mitchell. Four years later, Governor Rudy Perpich appointed her to the Minnesota Supreme Court. She remained on the court for 17 years until she retired in 1994 at the mandatory age of 70. Playwright August Wilson brought audiences a new understanding of the black experience in America in a series of critically acclaimed dramas. He was born in 1945 in a black slum in Pittsburgh. His father was absent and his mother depended upon public assistance and income from cleaning jobs. She raised her six children in a shoddy two-room apartment without hot water or a telephone. He would learn to read at age four, experience racial taunts as the only black child at a mostly white parochial school, and drop out of school at 15 after one of his teachers wrongly accused him of plagiarism. She refused to believe that a black child could produce such a well-written term paper on Napoleon on his own. So he began to educate himself at the Pittsburgh Public Library, reading works by African-American writers such as Richard Wright and Langston Hughes. But while his roots were in Pittsburgh, he found his voice as a playwright when he moved to St. Paul in 1978. 
In St. Paul, he became associated with Minnesota's Playwrights Center and later with the Penumbra Theater Company, which premiered many of his works. Wilson died in 2005, leaving a legacy of 10 plays, each documenting a different decade of life in America. Two of his best-known works, Fences and The Piano Lesson, each won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama in 1987 and 1990, respectively. He is the recipient of numerous other awards and honors, including a 1987 Tony Award for Fences. On July 26, 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, was signed by President George H.W. Bush. The ADA was the first comprehensive civil rights law for people with disabilities in the world. The act prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in employment, public services, public accommodations, and in telecommunications. Since its passage, the act has become a part of our national consciousness, leaving its indelible stamp on our institutions and culture. Accessible parking places, closed captioning, service dogs joining their companions in restaurants, elevator numbers in Braille, all resulted from the ADA. The act has brought people with disabilities into the mainstream of American life, into restaurants and shopping malls, schools and places of worship, and the workplace. No wonder it has been described as the Civil Rights Act for America's 54 million people with disabilities. In 2002, more than 13,500 legal immigrants arrived in Minnesota, more than in any previous year in the past two decades. They came from 160 countries, with immigrants born in Somalia outnumbering all the others, followed by those from India, Ethiopia, and Mexico. More than 90% of all immigrants settled in the Minneapolis-St. Paul, Rochester, and St. Cloud areas. But the impact of immigration was felt throughout the state. Nearly one quarter of Mexican immigrants, 20% of Canadians, and 12% of Somalis settled outside these metropolitan areas. The trend continued, setting a new record in 2005 with more than 15,000 new arrivals, the highest number in 25 years. Two of every five came from Africa, from Somalia, Ethiopia, Liberia, and Kenya, but Mexico, China, Vietnam, Russia, and Canada were also among the top 10 countries that had contributed to a changing Minnesota. Why did they come? Why did they keep arriving? They came for many of the same reasons Germans, Swedes, and Norwegians settled in Minnesota in the 1800s. In a word, opportunity. On the 150th anniversary of Minnesota's statehood, opportunity remains at the heart of Minnesota's story, a bridge that unites our past with our hopes for the future. The opportunity for education, for cultural identity, religious freedom, economic prosperity, for a better life. It's the desire and birthright of all Minnesotans, yet our people have not always shared equally in the fruits of what Swedish immigrant and author Fredrika Bremer called, this Minnesota, a glorious country. For some, prejudice and discrimination have kept many doors closed, but we have struggled since the beginning to break down those doors and ensure that everyone has the opportunity to contribute. One milestone in this struggle is the Minnesota Human Rights Act that envisions and mandates a Minnesota that is discrimination free. As we celebrate our sesquicentennial, we know that despite the inevitable complaints about sub-zero weather, Minnesota is an exceptional place with exceptional people. And it can be an even better place, especially if we learn from our 150 year history. Because the future, the next chapter, is up to all of us.